Hey, Mike here. And if you like what I'm doing on the podcast and elsewhere, and if you want to help me help more people get into the best shape of their lives, please consider checking out my VIP one-on-one -on -one coaching service where we can help you get in the best shape of your life. My team and I have helped people of all ages, circumstances, and needs. So no matter how complicated or maybe even hopeless you might think your situation is, we will figure it out and we will get you results. Every diet and every training program is 100% custom. We provide daily workout logs and do weekly accountability calls. Our clients get priority email service and discounts on supplements and other products, and the list of benefits goes on and on. So to learn more, head over to www.legionathletics.com slash coaching. That's L-E-G-I-O-N athletics.com slash coaching and schedule your free consultation call. I should also mention that there is usually a wait list and new slots do fill up very quickly. So do not wait if this sounds even remotely interesting to you. Go ahead and schedule your call now. Again, that URL is legionathletics.com slash coaching. Hello, boys and girls. Welcome, welcome to another episode of the Muscle Life Podcast. I am Mike Matthews, and we are here to talk about metabolic flexibility. What is that? Well, one of the problems with rigidly following a restrictive or even just a narrowly focused dietary protocol like low carb, which I'd say is more of a restrictive protocol, or even low fat, high carb, which is more just narrowly focused, right? Um, and, and the reason why I'd say low carb is more restrictive is in actual practice, it's more restrictive. There are just a lot more foods that you can't eat that you probably want to eat than when you are following uh, a low or lower fat and higher carb diet. Anyways, so the problem is when you do that uh, very rigidly for a long time, when you do go off plan for whatever reason, you can get slapped. For instance, if you are a high carber and you miss a meal, you might find that your energy levels plummet. Or if you are a low carber and let's say you splurge on some cake, let's just have a piece of cake at a party, you might then find yourself craving and probably eating every other carb in sight. Now, ideally, these things wouldn't happen. Ideally, our bodies would be able to adapt to varying dietary circumstances to maintain an even physiological keel. In other words, our bodies ideally would possess a fair amount of metabolic flexibility. Now, if you haven't heard of this term before, I understand because few people have. And in this episode, Curtis Frank, the one and only Curtis, returns to explain what it is and how to improve it so our bodies can better shift between different fuel types, which as he explains is really what this comes down to. Because if our bodies can do that, they can be more adaptable to whatever situations we find ourselves in. And in case you are not familiar with Curtis, he is the co-founder and the former lead researcher and writer of examine.com. And he is the current director of research and development for my supplement company, Legion Athletics. So here's a quick sneak peek of some of the things that we talk about in this interview. We talk about insulin resistance and carb sensitivity as you age. We talk about the signs that you lack metabolic flexibility and could benefit from some of the tips he's gonna share. He talks about how to avoid sugar crashes or carb triggered food binges and more. Curtis has returned or is it Beef Chungus has returned? That is my name today. I am the Chungus. Good. And, you know, I had to Google that. And then apparently, according to Urban Dictionary, that it includes, but is not limited to a chunky anus is the definition. And you didn't know that. So you learned something. I did not. But if we redefine that as beefy glutes, then I shall partake in that definition. <laughs> Striated beefy glutes. Oh, man, I need two chairs. My glutes are that Chungus. <laughs> Imagine. Imagine you're on an airplane and that's the complaint. <laughs> My glutes are too large. Give me two yeah. seats. <laughs> just put the armrest up and you're good. Or just spill over, invade their safe space. 
We're not here to talk about chunky anuses or glutes. We're here to talk about metabolic flexibility. Now, what does that mean? Is that a term that you just made up? I feel like it's something that gets thrown around at all. Do other people talk about this? It's a somewhat niche term, and it's technically non-legitimate. So it's not a scientific terminology. It's kind of like how in the past when I talked about pseudovitamins, pseudovitamins is not a legitimate term at all. So if you try to like look through scientific evidence for pseudovitamins, you won't find anything because it's a non-legitimate term that if it gets enough popularity, maybe it becomes legitimate. And metabolic flexibility is also one of those things. But whether it's legitimate or not, we can still talk about the concepts behind it. And at least when it comes to metabolic flexibility, that particular operationalization has been like temporary definition. That's what operationalization means. Has been usually for coaches that deal with athletes. They know of this. And people who are trying to just cause weight loss or weight gain in people who are athletic. At the end of the day, the entire initial premise of metabolic flexibility was we could use carbs as fuel or we could use fats as fuel. But sometimes we come across people who really easily use carbs as fuel, but for some reason they never use fats. And there are some people who very preferentially use fats as fuel, but if you give them carbs, they don't get extra fuel. They just can't utilize it that well. So the concept of can we switch between these two fuel sources is what led to the idea of metabolic flexibility. And you just mean genetically, you're saying that their bodies are more suited to burning carbs versus fats and vice versa? It's not necessarily genetic, although that is a component. It is also just habituation. If you have a diet that's like, say, 30% proteins, 50% carbs, and then 20% fats, that's a very high carb diet. So if you have that every day for a few months, your body will be forced to adapt to a high carb diet. But then if you immediately switch to a ketosis diet where you have no carbs and just a bunch of fats, your body was just forced to adapt to using carbs as a fuel source. And now you're going to be temporarily unable to find enough glycogen to actually use this fuel and you're going to go through some hell for a short period of time until your body adapts once more. And furthermore, if you're adapted to using carbohydrates as a fuel source, you may be a bit stronger when it comes to anaerobic exercises, but your aerobic exercises are going to just fucking suck. But if you are adapted to fats, then you could be like an incredible jogger and all that, but you're going to be weak as hell. Is that the case though with, you know, don't you find high carb diets are still the, the go-to for endurance athletes? It's because they have metabolic flexibility. They can balance between the two things. They're not eating that high carb diet for like two months straight then. They're, I guess you could say, cycling through their macros, I guess. Essentially, but like the entire idea behind metabolic flexibility is that if you can have carbs and fats in your diet and utilize both of them efficiently, you're going to be top grade, like top notch and all that stuff. But if for some reason there is an impairment that prevents you from switching between the two on an as needed basis, you can only unlock the uh, bioenergetic potential of one of them, but not both. So I guess it kind of depends what you're doing. Like if you're just an everyday person who's lifting weights and doing a little bit of cardio here and there, a high carb diet probably generally is just going to be the way they go, right? Depends. Like as long as you're not insulin resistant, like for me, I generally go by the idea where you would want a higher protein and carb diet, maybe lower fat diet in youth until you get to that point where carbs start making you fat and then you start transitioning over to a lower carb, higher fat diet. But if you do that transition well, like... Just to clarify, when you say carbs making you fat, obviously, I mean, you're not saying that eating carbs equals getting fatter, but you just mean as insulin resistance goes up, your body just gets worse and worse at processing the carbs that you eat, right? Correct. The carbs inherently do not make you fat. But as you age, different changes occur to your body, and there may very well be a day where the carbs are not processed as well as they should be, and they're more obesogenic than when you were like 18 or 20 or so. And is that the case if you do a good job taking care of yourself, though? If you stay active and you are, let's say, an above average in terms of muscularity and you have a, a healthy body fat level and so forth? It is my personal belief that the change from carbs to fat during the aging process will be inevitable. But by being active, by having a high muscularity and just take care of your health, you can delay that day for as long as you can. 
But that being said, like, it's not a specific topic of research where there's too much evidence on it. Like, just seeing people who were in their 20s and monitoring their diets for, like, 80 years kind of thing. Like, that's not something we have direct evidence on. It's always going to be theoretical. That's interesting. I haven't heard of that before. Well, like, it's just more of a health theory and all that because all the fat old people I've seen still eat a ton of carbs. The more healthy old people I see tend to have lower carb diets while at the same time being athletic. The ones I talk to, at least, they all mention that they always ate carbs until one day carbs just didn't sit well with them and then they started reducing them. Yeah, I've had people mention that to me, actually, people who were always into fitness. So it's not like these weren't sedentary people and they weren't just ignorant and they just noticed a difference. Yeah, I have people say that there was a point, I want to say 40s would probably be the earliest, probably more in the 50s. 50s where I've had people mention that to me where they're just like, yeah, there was a point when their body just didn't seem to do as well with carbs as it once did, even though they are still doing everything they've always been doing. They're staying in shape, they're exercising, like they couldn't do anything better, actually. They're doing everything they can. Yeah, so it's just a natural consequence of aging. When you age, like this stuff's going to happen eventually and nothing's permanent. Like we're all going to die one day. I don't want to get too nihilistic on everyone listening here, but the best we can do is to sort of delay that. And the reason I believe personally that these people were able to handle carbs so well for so long is because through just a balance of athleticism, a good diet and just good rest and all that, they preserved metabolic flexibility for as much as they reasonably could. And then the aging process started to kick in. And then they they started to have to respect the limitations of their body. Yeah, that's a good way to put it. Yeah. The main problem that I see is when there's people who are far younger, say people who are like 25 years old or so, and they're already reporting like, oh, I can have like a nice carby breakfast, but then I have a sugar crash an hour later. It's like, no, you're 25. That should not be happening. And in that case, I mean, obviously there are many different reasons why that could be happening, but if we're assuming that they are generally taking care of themselves, I guess that's where this point of metabolic flexibility could come into play. Yes, because when it comes to a sugar crash, you're basically saying that you put carbohydrates in your body and they energized you and you felt good. But then you went along your day or whatever, and eventually your body metabolized all those carbohydrates. And at this point, it should have shifted the load for energy towards the fat stored in your abdomen or wherever on your body. Like there should have been a transient shift towards, okay, the carbs are done, fats pick up the slack. And then it should have been smooth going on from there. But when you come to a sugar rush, like uh, excluding any potent drugs, like if you take sugars laced with amphetamines, like obviously you're going to feel a crash. But if it's just sugar, then you should have just been cruising for the next few hours. If you feel a crash because of that, it's because your body was unable to mobilize fatty acids to provide energy in a sufficient manner, which means that for one reason or another, your body just preferred to utilize carbs and did not pass the buck over to fats what it needed to be. And if your body is in such a state, then, well, at the very least, you're going to have sugar crashes every time you eat carbs. And that's just not a good way to live. And you're probably also going to have a very hard time following any sort of intermittent fasting type diet. And if you miss a meal, you're not going to feel great. And those are also things that I'm sure are natural consequences of lacking that metabolic flexibility. Yeah, because if you're, say, an 18-year-old Olympian-level athlete, you could temporarily deal with the lack of metabolic flexibility as long as you just keep on pumping carbs in your face. If the sugar rush goes high, then as it's about to go down, you just eat more sugars, it's going to be high again. So as long as you have like that whole like, six to eight meals a day, all high-carb stuff, You can mitigate this stuff, even though you have no metabolic flexibility, but you become obscenely dependent on the foods that you're eating. But when it comes to just somebody who has a day job and has to have a breakfast and get out of the office, it's no longer a practical option for them. They need to train their body to hop between carbohydrates and fats for energy and get the body used to the idea that, you know, they're both available energy sources. 
you can't just use one over the other. You have to kind of use both. Hey, quickly, before we carry on, if you are liking my podcast, would you please help spread the word about it? Because no amount of marketing or advertising gimmicks can match the power of word of mouth. So if you are enjoying this episode and you think of someone else who might enjoy it as well, please do tell them about it. It really helps me. And if you are going to post about it on social media, definitely tag me so I can say thank you. You can find me on Instagram at Muscle for Life Fitness, Twitter at Muscle for Life, and Facebook at Muscle for Life Fitness. And maybe a good place to start in terms of practicality would be what are some signs, just things that people could go, oh yeah, that's me, that you lack metabolic flexibility. So you've mentioned sugar highs and sugar crashes. What are some other signs? Because I'll take myself as an example. I don't know. I, I think I'm pretty good in terms of, even though I do follow a higher carb diet, it's not super high carb, but like right now I'm eating in a slight surplus on my training days and then a, a larger deficit on my rest days just to mitigate some of the fat gain. And so on my training days, I'm eating a fair amount of carbs. So I'm eating probably 450 grams or so. So it's not crazy, but it's quite a bit. But then take, let's say on the weekends, because I'm eating about 2000 calories per day on Saturday and Sunday, I'll usually skip breakfast just so I can get the calories in. I'll skip breakfast and I'll kind of eat light throughout the day, mostly just some protein, maybe in some fruit, and then just have a bigger dinner because I just enjoy it more that way. And so I find that I'm I'm fine. I feel good on my training days. It's nice to have a bit more energy and I don't have any energy highs or energy lows unless maybe I didn't sleep well. And on the weekends when I'm fasting for that, really, I'm just skipping breakfast, but like, it's totally fine. I'm not hungry. I don't get energy. So someone like me, it sounds like I probably am fine in the metabolic flexibility department and wouldn't have anything to gain from maybe cycling my carbs up or my fats up or down or doing anything other than what I'm doing, right? Yeah, it seems like you're pretty much in the clear. So when it comes to seeing whether or not you're susceptible to this stuff, it depends on whether you're high carb or high fat because the symptoms are different. For somebody who's on a high carb diet, the main factor is, well, first, before we get into anything, I need to mention that carbohydrates in and of themselves do have the ability to cause euphoria, ton of energy. And I would say almost, well, to someone who's never had a carb in their life, it would definitely have a drug-like effect for how potent they can be. But we've all had carbs in our life, so we're kind of used to it. So to us, carbs just seem like a food source. To somebody who is on a high-carb diet, they will feel none of these acute effects of carbohydrates. They'll just feel energy but they become very reliant on food frequency and meal frequency, I should say is the better term. And so if they don't eat frequently, they have the sugar crashes, they all of a sudden have like reduced energy between meals, and they feel that they can never get something done unless they eat. It's fine for like a 19 year old Olympian, but when you're a 35 year old house mother trying to lose weight, and the only way you can get energy is by eating more food, that's not a good situation. So I would say that the main thing, if you're too carb dependent, is if you have a high carb diet and the meal frequency and the timing around the meals you have carbs, particularly also the glycemic index, just how fast the carbs hit you, if that has a very high relation with your mood state and your energy levels, you may be too reliant on carbs. And of course, if you go for like five hours without eating and you just turn into like a puddle of laziness and apathy upon the ground, you're probably too reliant on carbs. Conversely, when it comes to people who are like super low carb dieters or keto dieters, they're becoming very adapted to using both fatty acids as well as ketone bodies to fuel their bodies. But they become susceptible to carbohydrates. And if a keto dieter is able to you know, go to a party with a few family friends, have a cupcake and just enjoy the party and go home, they're in a good position. But if a keto dieter, it has some sort of high glycemic carbohydrate, and then they immediately go into binge mode where they just, as I mentioned uh, before our podcast started, 
turn into the Hulk and destroy every bakery within the city, then they're not in good state of metabolic flexibility because carbohydrates are hitting them too hard. They become pretty much subject to the carbohydrates that go in their face. The food has more power over them than their own thoughts do. Too horny for carbs. Uh, they're horny for yeah. the carbs. That's at what this I'm saying. Point. Too horny for carbs. They're <laughs> yeah. It's too much, man. Yeah, pretty much. At the end of the day, it's all about your lifestyle and just how you feel about this stuff. If you ever feel that by deviating from your diet a little bit, particularly when it comes to energy providing macronutrients, if you deviate and you suffer from that, then the plan that you're on is not suited towards your body. Because after all, a diet plan is supposed to support your body, support your lifestyle, and support whatever you do. But if you are condemned to your lifestyle plan, and the moment you step out of it, then you just suffer because you deviated just the slightest, then the diet plan has more power over you than you have over yourself. So it's a shitty diet plan. And it's, and it's also just completely impractical. And what are you gaining yeah. from it? I mean, again, unless your entire life revolves around your physical performance and for whatever reason, that diet is what maximizes your physical performance and it just sucks and you know that and any deviation from it is not enjoyable, but it gives you that tiny extra edge that can make all the difference at, in a high level sports Okay, I guess that could be an argument for it, but for an everyday person who just wants to look good, feel good, why go through that? Yeah, there's really no reason aside from the fact that like going into an extreme can at least for someone who just started the diet provide rapid and drastic results. But then they just kind of get used to the fact that this diet did me a benefit, thus I should stay on this diet. And they don't change it all. Carnivore diet, for example. Yeah, pretty much. Which is Honestly, I have to say it's one of the stupidest things I've ever heard. Yeah, I wrote a long article about it and recorded a podcast on it. And it just makes no sense unless unless you need to do a true elimination diet, I guess. And that's a good way is to eliminate literally everything and just have some meat and start there and see what is messing your body up. But yeah, but even then, like, do you mind if I sidetrack a little bit? I'm all about tangents. Oh, sweet. So because like uh, one of the intellectuals that I follow the most that I adore the works of is Jordan Peterson. So you're a racist Nazi. Oh, totally. Definitely racist Nazi. All right, perfect. We've established like, that. Uh, liberal Nazis, they're a plague. But yeah, like the entire thing with Jordan Peterson is like whenever he speaks about his own field, psychology, I'm not in a position to disagree with him because the expertise is that much. When it comes to political issues, I am in a position to disagree because neither of us are politicians, but I don't want to disagree because he seems right and all that stuff. And then he mentions, like, yeah, I'm on an all-beef diet and I don't eat vegetables or anything. And I'm just sitting there raging on my computer. It's like, no, you were the chosen one. You were supposed to bring intelligence to the world, not to be a fucking dietary charlatan at the end of the day. <laughs> His next book will be a diet book and he'll start selling. He'll turn into a Stephen Gundry dude. He'll start selling fake, fake supplements and shit. Jordan Peterson and the Metachlorians, how I became Anakin Skywalker, that kind of shit. Like, and you just got to take the supplements. But the entire thing is like, he had health problems, which is fine. Like, you know, we all have health problems every now and then. And he went into a phase one of an elimination diet where all he ate was meat. And, you know, that's a decent start to an elimination diet. But the entire point of an elimination diet is after you've proven that for week one, there's no health side effects with what you're eating. You're supposed to start adding in more to see what the problems are. Oh, you can eat beef and chicken. That's great. Let's add in broccoli and see if that harms you. Broccoli did not harm you? Congratulations, you're allowed to end the diet. Next week, bring some onions. How do you feel? Oh, you kind of feel bad? I guess onions don't treat you that well, so you leave the onions out. That's the entire point of elimination diet. But he's been on this completely meat-eating diet for like, Almost a year now, I believe, probably even more than that. It's amazing how resilient the body is. That's amazing that it can survive on such a nutritionally bankrupt diet. Yeah. And like the other thing is that for him, when it comes to Peterson, it's when you just talk about diet or whatever, like he admits that he's not an expert in diet. So at the very least, I appreciate that. But he mentioned how he had like apple cider once and it damn near incapacitated him for a month. And it's like, Dude, you're literally a glass house right now. 
and there's a little crack and you're incapacitated because of a fermented apple. Humans are evolutionarily designed to be trash compactors who can eat literally anything and a fermented apple KO'd you for a month. I, not only KO. You're not in a good intestinal state right now. But didn't he said that like he didn't sleep for 30 days or something? And I think that was Oh, he was just he was just aggrandizing it. I, I forget who was interviewing him. They were like, wait a minute, you're saying you literally he's like Yo, know, if he truly did not sleep for 30 days, he'd be dead. He'd be dead. dead. Of Straight course. Up. No, but he was saying that. He was like, literally, I think it was I drank the apple cider and then I didn't sleep for 30 days. It's like, no, actually that didn't happen. Yeah. I'm sorry. That didn't happen. So why are you even saying this? I think a better interpretation would be I did not sleep well for 30 days because I have met people in the past who. I mean, if I remember, he emphasized like not even a wink, literally did not sleep. That was the point, like his Joe Rogan interview when he said that before that. Oh, was it Rogan? I remember seeing yeah, a clip and I was on, like, uh... he was on the Joe Rogan show when he said that. But that was quite literally the point where I stopped being a diehard fanboy and only became a regular fanboy. See, <laughs> as soon as he started talking about die, it's like, bro, I respect you because you're a field, but this is my field. So with all due respect, shut the fuck up. Yeah, just go back to refusing to use people's pronouns. Come yeah, on. exactly. Like that stuff I can understand and all that, but go back to OG Peterson. Get away from this this new this new age shit. OG Peterson. <laughs> on the other note, I have met people who had for their entire lives had no problems with sleeping because they define themselves as people who went to bed and then just sort of fell asleep for eight hours. Head hits the pillow, boom, it's the morning now. Honestly, that's a superpower. I want that. I used to have it, dude. I lost it. I used to have it. But once I had kids, I don't know if it's ever coming back. Yeah, like I've never had that. But I've met some people who had it and lost it. And when they wake up three times in a single night, they've come to me panicking saying, oh my God, I'm getting like literally no sleep. I just can't sleep at all. How long? Just sleep. Eight hours, but I never slept. You can't sleep for eight hours and then not sleep for eight hours. Okay, maybe I woke up for one hour. So you slept for seven hours. Well, yes, but it was hard. <laughs> no, it wasn't. Yeah, no. Try waking up every hour and a half. Try that. Or just laying in bed, staring at the ceilings, thinking, God damn, it would be nice if the sun rose right now so I can leave this place. Yeah, that's no fun. Anyways, I need to like segue back into metabolic flexibility. So the last thing I think what you were laying out is like some signs that you might be lacking in this department and it could benefit from changing up your diet a bit and not eating such a maybe a, a high carb or such a high fat, low carb diet exclusively forever. If you're on a high carb diet, but there is no abnormalities to your lifestyle whatsoever, then feel free to continue with a high carb diet. But be aware that if you are on a high carb diet for too long, you could be susceptible to sugar crashes and you could become over reliant on meal frequency. If as a high carb dieter, you can't go just half a day without eating food, your body's probably not in the best health state. It's got too adapted to using carbs, not enough to fats. Yep. Conversely, if you're on a high fat diet like keto, for example, or just if carbohydrates are below 20% to your caloric intake, and you have a high glycemic index carb, say a cupcake or a slice cake, or whatever, and that turns you into some raging binge eating monster, your body's not in a healthy state. Again, that's not a good thing. But of course, if you are on a ketosis diet and you have a muffin and you're fine, continue on as normal. There's nothing wrong with that. But for people who are accustomed to these two diets and they figure out that like their body just can't handle the other energy source all that well, it may be prudent to go into some sort of cyclic manner of a diet would be the best way to say it. There's two ways to do this. The first is intermittent fasting, which would probably be more, I guess, enticing to people who have a high carb diet because to do an intermittent fasting, you need to just fast for half your waking hours, about eight hours straight. That alone will train your body to go without carbs for a while. And then the last eight hours when you work out, you can just eat all the carbs you want and the meal sizes get a bit bigger. For people who want a high fat diet and want to go through a cyclic approach, I would recommend doing an approach that has different dietary requirements each day of the week. But you define two days in the week as high carbohydrate days. 
Now, high carbohydrates does not need to be too high overall, just high relative to what you're taking in. So if you're on a keto diet, 30% carbs may be high for you, and that's fine for the cyclic approach. But then the other days, the medium ones would be like 10% carbs, maybe 15% carbs. And then the low days, which would take the majority of it. So like, let's do a three low days, two medium, two high approach. And you just try to do like a little sine curve throughout the uh, week. The low days would be true ketosis. The moderate days would be 10% low uh, glycemic index carbs. Then the high days, you can have a little treat. But it gets you some sort of cyclic approach where your body can start to get accustomed to using fats and carbohydrates as resources. And this doesn't need to be a permanent. Yeah, I was just going to say, I guess it would be, you could think of this as it's kind of in your toolbox. And if you notice some of the negative effects that Curtis, that you've been laying out, it's like, this is, you pull this out of the toolbox and do this for a couple of weeks and see how you feel. Yeah, pretty much. So like, just because some people on keto just love the lifestyle, but they love the lifestyle so much that they stick with it even when it hurts them. Because for as long as they have, they're in the keto mindset, they feel like they can push forward. So in a way, like taking them away from the keto mindset wouldn't actually be to their benefit. So you just want to give them a small break from the keto mindset, like a sort of week-long dietary vacation. In my preference, it would be a month or so, especially with the cyclic manner that I just mentioned. A month would probably be best. But then they just get back into the keto lifestyle after and see if they feel more comfortable, feel more competent. And also then I guess get back into it and after a month or so now have that carb again and see how do you feel this time? Does it still send you into a tailspin or do you feel all right? Exactly. The entire thing is like just you're supposed to make these diets work to your benefit. And if they're not working to your benefit, you may need to bring in a few tips and tricks to try to titrate the diet to your benefit. And doing a cyclical carb approach would be a nice tip or trick for people on keto diet, whereas intermittent fasting could be a very nice trick for people on a high carb diet who feel that they've become too reliant on frequent meals. Like I know personally speaking, like in my teenage years, I used to suffer from binge eating disorder, but it was all emotional stuff. So no matter what I did with, you know, my actual diet, the emotions were still there. So I had to like, you know, just work that shit up myself. But after the emotions set aside, I still had the physical repercussions of binge eating disorder, which was very parallel to, I guess in a way, both of them. When I had a, any high glycemic carb, I just want more. There have been times in my life where I've had 3000 calories over the course of 30 minutes. Nice. No, I'm talking like a daily endeavor. Like I used to be a football player, so I didn't care about body weight back then wasn't a good thing, but intermittent fasting did sort of train me. That's impressive. And that was mostly carbs that <laughs> when you eat that many calories? Like? Carbs and peanut butter. It was basically peanut butter and jelly sandwiches for the most part. Nice. That's like nice. it's just dangerous how much peanut butter you can eat in a short period of time. That's true. Yeah. And it doesn't even satisfy you. That's the worst part. It's not a, a food that I recommend for when people are cutting. Leave the nut butters out. They suck. Again, for 17-year-olds, you're just like, I tried eating 3,000 calories a day and I'm not getting weight. You're just like, oh boy, you can love peanut butter. Like, <laughs> they love it. But yeah, for me, like intermittent fasting really helped with my whole binge eating stuff. As soon as I got the emotions aside, because it didn't help with the emotions at all. That's something I had to do on my own. And, you know, I'd rather not talk about it right now, but... You know, that's more of a thing you need to see a psychologist for if the root of your binge eating is emotional. But as long as it's physiological, then intermittent fasting is your cure. Well, the cure for, I'd say, 60% of you. Still worth a try, though. And it's also easy to incorporate. <laughs> it's easy to incorporate, like yes. for me. Because like you wake <laughs> up in the morning and you have adrenaline and cortisol pretty high, so you don't need to eat food to get energy. And then you just think, maybe I should have breakfast, but then you just like grab an energy drink, down it in your throat, like, you know, sugar-free because no calories and all that stuff. Or just hit some espresso. That's what I would do. Yeah, like espresso, a sugar-free energy drink, maybe some ephedrine or whatever. Or maybe some pulse. <laughs> yeah, you just – pulse, definitely. <laughs> Top recommendation. Yeah, that's the key. But yeah, you just like shove a stimulant in your face while your cortisol and adrenaline high, and then you just get the 
hell away from your kitchen and start doing work. And eight hours can pass pretty easily once you're amped on the desire to do work. And after those eight hours, you think, oh, my fast is done. I can actually eat now. And then you just enjoy a meal. Obviously, you don't go like complete binge mode, but you can have a nice sizable meal because you didn't eat for the previous eight hours. And you just do this for a few months and your body gets used to not eating. And when your body gets used to not eating, it sort of gets desensitized the idea of eating too much. So it really helps with binge eating stuff from my experience. Again, I do that twice a week usually I'll just skip breakfast on the weekends on my non trainers I usually do some cardio but I'm not lifting on the weekends and I'm in a deficit so I'll just skip breakfast and start eating I don't know maybe around noon or one or something yeah like even my mother does intermittent fasting and she's an Italian chef so if she can do it anyone can if an Italian chef can just go yeah and she's not going to eat right now then what's your excuse strong woman Oh, yeah, totally. <laughs> Out of all the uh, women of her age group that I've seen, I've seen women who, like, I don't know, they, like, play checkers and stuff. And then I've seen some women just, like, I'm just going to read a book and then maybe cook some beans. And then my mom's just like, yeah, I just got done with my work. And I'm going to throw some axes now. Do you want to join me? It's like, yes, ma'am. <laughs> That's what we need for... Uh, She's a little bit too Viking for an Italian. For the upcoming conflagration that's going to consume everything, she'll oh, be useful. We need the Viking Italians. She can swoop down south and maybe save us in our impending civil war. You Americans can't complain about that. Come on, Canada is just like worse. But, you know, that's another topic for another day. In some ways, of course, but in terms of just social and racial tensions and division? Probably not, right? I mean, pretty extreme. We have a human rights tribunal up here. And yes, tribunal, like the Warhammer 40k stuff. That's a good choice of word. <laughs> I like it. It's the legal word. Like It's literally a tribunal. <laughs> they should just go all in and call it an inquisition. They probably will. Like there's some guy like in BC, regardless of our listeners' views on transgenderism, because I know it's a somewhat hot topic, there is a politician who is a transgender woman, so male body, female mind. She was running for political office, and this guy said, I refuse to acknowledge this person's a woman, which is, you know, un falls into free speech. And so then he started posting up... You mean hate speech, bigot. And eventually fell under hate speech. <laughs> because uh, this person then made posters saying this politician claims that they are a woman, but they are a man because blah, 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 maybe a little bit of Christian mentality in there. And all they did was just staple these posters to telephone poles in their town. So they obeyed all laws. They were fined $55,000 for a hate crime. By the tribunal. The Inquisition got him. And then there's another case, I think. I think it might have been Ontario, but I might be wrong about that, where somebody wore shoes into a Muslim's house. And just to clarify for American viewers, if you go up to Canada, do not wear shoes in our houses. It's actually like a social sin up here. You're just walking around like mud and grass and shit and all that. And you don't wear those shoes inside the house. You take them off before you enter. That should be kind of obvious even i know it's not here and most people do that but it's kind of still bad etiquette even here but it's hardcore in canada you take one step with your dirty boots in your canadian house and like the idea of politeness just evaporate bruv the fuck you doing is like all the canadian <laughs> rage and like the freaking the saw spiked hockey sticks covered in barbed wire start coming out and it's like take off your shoes mate First, you get doused in maple syrup. And... Yeah. So, oh, yeah, because it, it's inflammable, definitely. But, like, <laughs> so he wore shoes into a family's house, and the family happened to be Muslim. And apparently, like, he said, like, whoops, my bad, or whatever. But he didn't say it in a polite way. He was kind of confrontational because he was a dick. But he was fined $12,000, not because he wore shoes in a house, but because he was religiously offensive. So, yeah. Do you have these tribunals down in America? Because... Not yet. They're coming, though. Oh, man. 
don't allow that to happen. I mean, now it's the court of public opinion. I mean, that's how it is right now. It's coming. Oh, yeah. It's not formalized, but it's, it's getting to a point where it's like a de facto tribunal where you have, if you think the wrong thoughts or say the wrong words, you could be effectively unpersoned. Ah, yes. The jonesing, as you call it. <laughs> I wonder if he'll uh, if he'll ever get back on those platforms. That'll be a a big day for him if that ever happens. No, I feel like Jones is probably going to go through like a whole Phoenix thing where he's not going to get back on the platforms, or even if he did have the option, he'd probably refuse it. But there's probably going to be some platform in the future that goes onto the market by saying, "Hey, everyone, we got Alex Jones," and then he's just going to like explode from like his egg of oppression. Is like gay frogs, and then everyone flocks to the platform because of it. The rallying cry. There's not just him. There are quite a few people that, and you already see that where oh, obviously yeah. markets move slowly, but that is what will happen. And that's one of the kind of the libertarian arguments, right? Of like, oh, just bro- make your own Facebook, bro, if you don't like it. And make your own YouTube. Like, yeah, okay. It's not that easy anymore. I mean, between Facebook, Twitter, Google and their different properties, there is the modern public square, really. But you'd think that given enough time, if free markets are allowed to work at least semi-efficiently, that is what will happen, is the reaction will be true open and free platforms, not necessarily even because, you know, obviously existing platforms skew very left. We don't necessarily even need platforms that are skewing right. We just need to go back to the pre- The neutral stuff. Yeah, exactly. The pre-psychotic phase. Yeah, I remember seeing a comic or whatever. I don't remember the artist's name. I think it was Stonewall or something. But it was basically just a picture of a guy who was like unplugging one website. It's like, Oh, you don't like us? I'm plugging this website. Why don't you make your own website? Next panel. Oh, you don't like us? I'm plugging your social media. Why don't you make your own social media? Then the other one was uh, in commentary to Patreon and MasterCard, uh, pulling out some of this stuff. Oh, you don't like this? Why don't you make your own bank? Then it's like, oh, you don't like this? Why don't you make your own government shit? Exactly. (laughs) (laughs) Just start sweating bullets at the end. Exactly. Taken to its logical extreme. Yeah, pretty much. But that requires like forethought and whatever, dude. You just, you know, you just live, you just do whatever feels right in the moment. If it feels right to ban, you just ban. The more I learn about politics, the more I'm interested in just like getting into hunting culture. It's like, oh, look at all these things that the rich people are doing and lying about. And I'm, I'm just going to go into the forest, get my own food now, but. <laughs> I'm just going to shoot an elk and eat it. It's like, that's a good retort, I guess. After the conflagration, you'll be able to. Yeah, like once uh, everything yeah. crashes and burning, I'll know how to get my own food. It's like, hey, you guys want elk? Too bad. <laughs> what do you got for me? Yeah. One other topic I wanted to mention, and when it comes to metabolic flexibility. Yeah, I was going to say, okay, so segue back to metabolic flexibility. It'd be like, see, if you're only eating elk, then eventually you'd need to improve your metabolic flexibility. So There's one other topic that I don't know too much about it, but I've seen uh, some studies investigating it. It's when it comes to exercise in and of itself. Because anaerobic stuff uses carbohydrates primarily. And aerobic stuff uses fatty acids primarily. So you might theoretically have somebody who is great at lifting weights and then they have like really bad cardio, but it's not due to their cardiorespiratory capacities, but their metabolic flexibility because they just can't have enough energy for a long run. Or they just like, you know, slight behind a lot. Then you have people who are like amazing endurance runners and it's like, oh, I can run 100 miles in one day at like an incredible pace. Oh, I can't even lift 30 pound dumbbells. And of course, like there's a lot of variables here. There could just be the actual muscularity of the person. There could be the you know training specificity of the person. But I will send you the links later so you can put it in the description. But fish oil supplementation has in a few studies shown that the rate of which the muscle cells can go from carbohydrate utilization to fat utilization and vice versa is increased. If you have a sport, say hockey, which every now and then you just have to go through like really rapid bursts, like just all completely anaerobic stuff, they can't keep up for more than 15 seconds. 
and then you need to keep active for the next 30 seconds or whatever, just cruising, like say if you're on defense or you're a goalie or whatever, then you need to be able to switch the two energy sources on the fly for your athletics. And fish oil seems to actually be a viable supplement for that. Interesting. How much do you need to take? It was definitely more than the super low doses of the 180-120 blend, like the 300 milligram stuff. That's the lowest dose. But I don't think it was the highest dose either. Like, I'll send you the studies, but I think it was around one gram of EPA plus DHA. Oh, very doable. What you should be. I, mean, I guess that's like it's almost just a basic health dose, right? When it comes to athletes, yes. But when it comes to just like the average person, the basic health dose is the 180-120 milligram or 300 milligrams EPA plus DHA. Like that's the lowest supplemental dose. And it's the one that's recommended to everybody with some medical doctors saying, yeah, maybe not go higher. But for athletes, usually athletes always have over a gram of EPA plus DHA. Yep. Neat. Another reason to just take fish oil every day. <laughs> or I don't know, krill oil, or I guess those are probably the two best sources. When you get into ALA sources, you run into absorption difficulties, right? For ALA stuff, yeah. But krill oil stuff is really weird. I don't like krill oil at all, to be honest. Really? Well, because it's the exact same as EPA plus DHA, except it's absorbed faster. But absorption speed is not an issue when it comes to fish oils. You just want it in your body. You want the overall absorption rate. It's the exact same. So if krill oil and fish oil were the exact same price, then you can choose either one you want. But krill oil is like three times the price of fish oil. Yep. I don't know if we ever bothered even getting quotes on krill oil because we decided early on, you remember when you were working on fish oil with me, we decided on fish oil right away. So I don't know if it's like a collagen protein thing where collagen protein is cheap as fuck. It's just a scam. You They sell it for a bunch of money. So is it just a margins thing or? I guess the opposite. If it's just expensive to produce then as well. So like our costs would be, yeah. you know, quite a bit higher. And then we just have to pass that on to customers. Yeah, sort of like, because when it comes to say a protein, Whey protein is one of the standards. Another standard could be soy concentrate, and then egg protein could also be a standard. They have different parameters for being called a standard, but they're all a reference point. They're a starting point. And if you want to sell something and say, like, it's better than whey, you need to use whey as the standard and then prove it's better than whey. But fish oil from, like, cold water low predatory fish, sardines, herring, all that stuff, that's the standard. And so you have all these other things like krill oil and seal oil coming forward, and they fail to prove that they're better than fish oil. They don't have any evidence. They don't have any logic. They just have a bunch of nonsensical buzzwords, and they try to say that they're a premium fish oil, which warrants a higher price, but they fail to prove that they're actually better than fish oil. So we use fish oil in its cheapest form because it works and nothing works better than that. We have an expensive form. The re-esterified ethyl ester is, is expensive. Just straight ethyl ester form is the cheapest, which we decided not to use. Yeah, I forgot about that. I meant the actual fish that we're uh, hunting down. We did modify it a little bit. That did raise the price a wee bit, but like we're still using the cheap fish. We're not using krill and we're not using seals. Yeah. Like whoever the hell marketed seal oil, I need to hunt down. <laughs> and I'm a Canadian. When it comes to seals and hunting, I'm getting my club. I know how to do this. You're going to get your shekels selling seal oil. Uh, no, man. Just, you have to protect the seals now. Is that a thing now? Is, is the seal bashing, has it come to an end? There's a meme about seal bashing, of course. The actual bashing part of seals is not really allowed on international or even national markets, but we will allow it when it comes to some Inuit populations up in the territories who need to actually kill something to eat yeah, for sure. the night. So they can bash seals and all that, but we don't allow any large industries to come in and collectively bash thousands of baby seals. We did that in the past, and it was not good because turns out that seals are kind of cute. They're the puppy dogs of the ocean, and bashing them in the back of the head does not give off good PR vibe. Was it like a tourist uh, almost type thing where people would pay to go out to bash seals? It almost got to that point. Like It became so prominent for a while because 
when it first became prominent, no one in Canada knew that this stuff was going on because the territories are incredibly sparse. The entire territories of Yukon, Northwest Territories, none of it. They have very low populations, and frankly speaking, no one in Canada cares about them, unfortunately. So when they do stuff, we don't really pay attention to them. So when they were bashing seals and making industries off of it, we didn't care. And then they started to like, you know, say, hey, you want to bash baby seals? Come up here. We can we have a bunch of baby seals. We've got a club. We can teach how to bash things. Yeah, baby seals. They go, bam. <laughs> you hit them. I guess you, like, you graduate. You know, um, I've seen these things in Japan where I'm sure they're elsewhere, but I remember seeing them in Japan where you go to a place and you can just break stuff to like release your rage. You can just break faces. <laughs> have you seen that? And <laughs> plates and just random shit. No, but I'm reminded of Legend of Zelda all of a sudden. Uh, why? So Legend of Zelda is a video game, right? Uh, maybe I played one of the Zelda games a while ago. Okay, but you know how Link goes around and he breaks all the pots? Ah, right, right, right. Yes, exactly. There, yeah, there's a lot of jokes about how Link is just actually a psychopath and he just like, runs in people's houses, breaks everything, steals all their money, and runs yes. away. Then everyone's just like, the heck is the hero of time doing? And Link's just like, I got my rupees. They just like breaks more pots and stuff. So like, I mean, think of american psycho you know the in the end when he's chasing the hooker with the chainsaw <laughs> <laughs> and he, he gets her and he's, ah! <laughs> yeah that that would be link definitely. perfect but yeah so as soon as the actual majority of canadians knew that we were bashing seals up north we put a stop to it but of course there's the whole um people need to sometimes bash seals to survive so that still goes on but the fact that they're trying to sell seal oil as a supplement means that seal fat can once again be an industry, meaning that, especially if it's sold in America, where else are you going to get your seals from? Russia? That's way too far away. So you're obviously going to get Canadian seals, and it's just going to like lead to major hunting, and now all of a sudden, all of Canadians really love the northern sea puppies. And so we don't like it when people hunt seals indiscriminately. So, yeah. The other reason that I don't like seal oil is because the premise of it is stupid. Oh, yeah, you've heard of EPA and DHA, but seal oil has DPA. It's another fatty acid. Newsflash, all fish have DPA. We literally just didn't care about it. We still shouldn't care about it. Every single fish that has EPA and DHA will have DPA. It's not unique to seals. A freaking herring or a sardine. Like you go to the grocery store, pop open a can, just down in your face, you got a bunch of DPA. There's nothing about the seals you need to take down. But yet some companies are like, well, we need another word aside from fish. What should we do? There's fish and there's krill. That's taken. Seals, yes, murdering seals is definitely going to go over well for a company. It's like, well, if you can get your DPA, I mean, come on. I know, right? Like, do you even know what DPA does? I didn't, and then I learned, and I still don't bloody know what it does because it just turns into DHA. <laughs> That's not what Dave Asprey said, though. I know, right? It's like fucking. Uh, I put. You said I put it in my coffee. Bulletproof and I'll, coffee uh, man said to kill all the innocent animals, so I guess I have to. And to get all the DPAs. <laughs> but yeah, to all you people listening, please don't hunt our glorious sea puppies. They're cute. Just get your oil from ugly fish like anchovies and like mackerel and stuff. Oh, if we could ever like farm lampreys, that'd be amazing. Or blobfish. Ugh. Like, oh my God, blobfish are so ugly. I have no sympathy for them whatsoever. <laughs> I just recently learned about the bobbit worm. You know about the bobbit worm? Vaguely. Yes. Uh, just check it out. After. Wait, is that the uh, tongue one? No, it's a sandworm that, I mean, these things can grow up to like, I don't know, 30 meters long. Oh, the spice they must burrow them. <laughs> they burrow. It's like a sarlacc monster from Star Wars. They burrow themselves down in the sand. Yeah. They have no brains and they have these hooked jaws that open up and kind of like click into place. They have some antennae that are in the middle. 
Yeah. And when fish, the, they can sense the movement of fish, and I think also shadows. So if there's, you know, if the light gets obstructed, and then they shoot out of the sand, I guess. Yeah, and then they're hooked, bony, almost they're like long hooks of jaws, just grab the fish and just pull them down into the sand, and the fish is just gone. That's kind of cool, actually. I like that. They can grab some bigger fish too. Have you heard about the? Uh, I don't know the species name, but it's the tongue replacing parasite. Basically, there's some parasites in the ocean that they will pretend to be prey so a fish eats them. But then they do that just so they get in the fish's mouth. And then they chew off the fish's tongue, and then they become the fish's tongue. (laughs) Is this a a tongue-eating louse? I don't know what a louse is. A disgusting little bug. Very similar. Then, yes, because like... There are some people who hunt at the deep sea and they like find fish and they open the fish's mouth. There was just an insect on yeah, the yeah, tongue. Yeah, yeah, tongue eat- like, It became the tongue. So the entire thing is they want to be there because once the fish eats more food, it gets first grabs at all the foods that goes into the oral cavity. So it will survive. And it also is kind of cutting off bleeding from the actual fish and it allows the fish to retain function. So it's a mutually symbiotic relationship. It's just fucking creepy as hell. Like, imagine some bug replacing your tongue, and it's like, no, I would rather that not happen. That's a good would you rather right there. Would you rather that or or something else? That's option A. Have an insect replace your tongue. (laughs) A tongue-eating louse uh, replaces your tongue. I've seen some stupid would you rathers lately. There's ones like, would you rather become the most hideous thing in existence but get the superpower of your choice and it's like bro just choose shape-shifting yeah but that, that'd be cheating they'd be like now nah, come on you're not playing in good faith oh come on man good faith is manipulative That's faith. True. when it comes to superpowers <laughs> it depends least, how you define faith you know faith is what i can bend to my will exactly the strong do it they will and the weak suffer what they must right also, I have to say that when I'm looking at my notes for this interview, I do have an entire section about Bruce Lee. Flow like a river is metabolic flexibility. Break like a brick is metabolic insensitivity. That's deep. I like that. Yeah, I don't know what I was thinking when I said that. but yeah. It's always good to include metaphors. People like metaphors. Should have done that the first hour. <laughs> <laughs> Who knows if anyone's even listening at this point, you know? This is where we can turn it loose. We might be alone by now. But no, this is actually a great discussion. Is there anything else that you had on your outline? Anything else that you want to cover before we wrap up? No, the major thing was basically just realizing when your diet is going against you and the fact that even though you plan for X, you're not always going to run into X. You may run into Y. You have to be ready for both of them. So if you focus on metabolic flexibility a bit, you focus on just partaking in different areas of athleticism. You can be prepared for anything. But beyond that, like it's not something that supplements can handle all that much. It's just don't do the same shit each day. Be a bit different. And that's pretty much it. Intermittent fasting and cycling your macronutrients and calories can help. Perfect. Don't be boring. <laughs> don't have a boring diet. Don't have a boring life and you're good. Thanks, Dad. You are welcome, son. <laughs> Now do your homework. <laughs> All right, Curtis. Well, it's, it's been great as always. Is yeah. there anything that is new and interesting that we should give people a heads up on? Maybe on the formulation front, like I'm excited, for example, for the new recharge that's coming. I'm excited for the men and women's multivitamins. I think that's going to be a smart bifurcation, as smart people say. I hate that word, actually, when people say they'll use that word instead of just like divide or split. Like, "Mm, I think we should bifurcate these people into two groups. Like, okay, buddy. Oh, yes. And then synergize them Uh, after. I'm excited for the men and women's multivitamins. What else do we got? What do we got coming? Make people horny to buy things. The first reformulation should be Fortify, which is pretty much the exact same formulation, except the curcumin has been enhanced for absorption. And we don't need black pepper anymore after that. So there may have been some instances where people did not take Fortify because they thought piperine or the black pepper extract could interfere with pharmaceuticals. No longer the case because piperine is getting dropped because we actually managed to find a better and not outrageously overpriced curcumin source. And then we added in something for a neuropathic pain. Everything we had at this point in time was just for muscular pain. But if you do have any pain related to, say, 
the spine or the neck or just bones and nerves, Fortify can now actually start to help you a little bit. And then beyond that, we added a few other goodies that just could overall help a certain amount of people and didn't increase the price too much. Should be pretty much the exact same price, but it's twice as good heading forward. There is, of course, the male and female formulation split for Triumph, which I'm looking forward to because there's not as many random herbs in there anymore. They're more well thought out, specifically chosen herbs, as well as non-herbal components that just benefit everybody regardless of their demographic. We were a little bit too haphazardous on our first formulation, and we've learned from that, and we've just made improvements henceforth. And then finally, Phoenix, our fat burner. We are taking a bit of a change with that, and we're making it so it's more along the lines of something you take every day and don't need to cycle off of. Something that just cleanly but slowly increases the metabolic rate. But it may also end up being a fat burner that you end up having to take with food, which is fine because if you want a fat burner that you take fasted, you do have forge on the side. That's not going to be changing anytime soon. But yeah, Phoenix is going to be a pretty atypical and novel fat burner in the next few months because it's taken an approach no other fat burner has before. One that you simply take with a meal to increase overall daily caloric expenditure. We have to get some of that works, and if we don't have ephedrine with us, then what can we do? All we can do is look at the evidence and say what actually increases basal metabolic rate and why and try to put them into a pill. And all the stuff I found, it doesn't matter if it's taken before or after exercise, doesn't matter whether it's taken twice or once a day, it's just put this in your mouth, your basal metabolic rate increases a little bit. And since some of them are fat soluble, you just kind of put them in your mouth with a meal. I like it. it. Yeah, because in the past, like it was always fat burners paired with exercise, but this one literally has no need for it. If you want to pair a fat burner with exercise, go for Forge. Get the Ohimbean in you. Maybe get some over-the-counter ephedrine and pair that with the Forge. That would be the optimal approach if you can handle the stimulation. You probably will be able to, but have to give the warning anyways. Makes sense. All right, man. Well, there's a bit more also. Like I said, that we have a new recharge formulation coming. We have also, we have the new pulse formulation that's rolling out now, which is cool. That's with the alpha GPC. We have the immunity product that's, it was tabled previously, but I, I wanted to, I wanted to discuss that again, actually, because I think the reason why I think it was when it was being discussed by the board, it was mostly, I believe, Spencer who was like meh about it, but I still thought it was interesting. So Anyways, we have more things, more things always in the works. I can't wait till the immunity product actually hits the market because we are bringing in a compound that is not really sold in North America, and yet it has enough evidence to rival pharmaceuticals and is obscenely potent. So as soon as that gets on the shelves... You can get it. It's just hard to get, and it's very expensive. You have to order from Germany or something like that. All right, my friend. Thanks again for taking the time. It's always a pleasure, and I'll talk to you soon. (laughs) Talk to you soon. Hey, Mike here. And if you like what I'm doing on the podcast and elsewhere, and if you want to help me help more people get into the best shape of their lives, please consider checking out my VIP one-on-one coaching service where we can help you get in the best shape of your life. My team and I have helped people of all ages, circumstances, and needs. So no matter how complicated or maybe even hopeless you might think your situation is, we will figure it out and we will get you results. Every diet and every training program is 100% custom. We provide daily workout logs and do weekly accountability calls. Our clients get priority email service and discounts on supplements and other products and the list of benefits goes on and on. So to learn more, head over to www.legionathletics.com coaching. 
That's legionathletics.com slash coaching and schedule your free consultation call. I should also mention that there is usually a wait list and new slots do fill up very quickly. So do not wait if this sounds even remotely interesting to you. Go ahead and schedule your call now. Again, that URL is legionathletics.com slash coaching.